there, welcome to Colloquio's Classroom, U.S. History Edition. Today's video, we're going to start off with the creation of America. You know, home to aerosol spray cheese and 48-ounce soft drinks. Thanks, 7-Eleven. We all know that in 1776, our founding fathers declared independence from Great Britain, but why did they do it? And how much change did it actually bring? Well, let's take a look as we journey back to the colonial age. So the first event in the American Revolutionary history was at the end of the French and Indian War. You know, that war that took place because the American colonists wanted the Ohio River Valley for some reason. Uh, and that was land that the British didn't have. The French actually owned it. And they were like, hey, colonists, that's totally not our land. You can't just go in there and take it. And the colonists were like, nah, we're going to do it anyways. We're just going to ignore you, mom and dad. You guys are lame. And uh, so the colonists go in, George Washington, he's the leader of that army, and they get their butts kicked, and thusly the French and Indian War begins. Um, jump to the end, eventually the English do win the war, but it comes at a great cost, and we're going to be under some huge debt because of that. Now, before we talk about the debt, you have to remember that the colonists formed together to gain an alliance with the Iroquois tribe of New York in Albany. This was known as the Albany Plan of Union, and it's really important to look at this as the first grouping together of American colonies without the British. Now, they weren't trying to declare independence from the British, and they weren't against the British. They were just trying to gain support for their fight against the French. Okay, let's jump to 1764. Now, the war ends, Treaty of Paris, France loses the Ohio River Valley, and pretty much most of Canada. Oh, Canada. Now, the British own the Ohio River Valley, and colonists get excited because they want to go to this new land. Now, unfortunately, the Proclamation Act of 1763 prevents them from going there. That's like if your parents built, like, this awesome treehouse that you've been, like, waiting for, and they just say, no, you can't go, and by the way, we put up an electric fence to prevent you from even trying to go there. Uh, then England starts to enforce taxes that they have previously kind of looked the other way from not charging, like on molasses and sugar, and now they start putting on stamps, which was like a stamp on most paper products like newspapers and lawyer licenses and liquor licenses, because, you know, it's pretty brilliant of an idea to tax people that are sure to use a printing press or, you know, that's a lawyer who probably has a drinking problem. Good idea, England. Well done. So, obviously, the Stamp Act is going to be boycotted, meaning that they're not going to buy those products, and they're going to pass other acts, like the Townsend Acts, the Quartering Act, and the Tea Act, and the colonists get all fed up, hot, and bothered about this, and they're going to rebel against most of these acts, most famously during the Boston Tea Party of 1773, which, in December, they got all half-naked, dressed up like Native Americans, and threw a million pounds of uh, tea into Boston Harbor, thusly creating the largest cup of iced tea ever. It's a world record. So obviously the British aren't too happy about this reaction, but due to the large distance between them and the colonies, news takes like two months to get there. The king's mad, Parliament's mad, they send the Intolerable Acts. The Intolerable Acts shut down the Boston Harbor, prevented any town meetings, uh, and, only, and allowed soldiers to be quartered into the civilian houses, thusly starting a new quartering act. Uh, this did not go so well with the colonists, especially with the Sons of Liberty members like Sam Adams stating, This country shall be independent and we will be satisfied with nothing short of it. So was this war about taxes? About soldiers living in houses? Well, not quite. In fact, the taxes weren't even really that big of a deal. I mean, everyone pays taxes. The colonists paid local taxes, but they were just amazed by the fact that a country 3,000 miles away could actually tax them. This was because England had never taxed the colonies as much. You know, they were usually taxing them about 1 20th of the rate of normal British citizens. And once again, they, they're not upset about the taxes. They understand that taxes pay for things that the government provides, but they didn't understand why somebody so far away would be collecting them. Uh, during the 18th century, um, we're going to talk about philosophers' ideas that were flying around through the streets and in libraries, you know, that place where books are, yeah, yeah, whatever. And it was people like John Locke, whose ideas of life, liberty, and property started to inspire people, these ideas of natural rights that were born with these rights that can't be taken away from us. So these ideas would inspire Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, to <laughs> borrow these natural rights to inspire people to break away from England. Jefferson also writes that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator to certain unalienable rights, meaning that no government can take these rights away, and these are the Ideas of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, starring Will Smith and Son of the Karate Kid. So, mixed together, unfair taxation, a little bit of prevention of natural rights. You throw in a massacre of six people in Boston, and boom, you got the American Revolution. 
April 19, 1775, it's seen as the official start of the Revolutionary War because it's the first battle, Lexington and Concord. However, it can be said that the first act of revolution actually occurred in 1774 at the First Continental Congress when 12 delegates met from 12 states. And I say 12 because Georgia didn't go. Way to go, Georgia. So, at this First Continental Congress, they talked about boycotting British goods. It was in reference to this whole intolerable act. Everybody was mad. They didn't want to uh, buy British goods, uh, but they weren't declaring independence yet. That would happen at the Second Continental Congress, which would happen in 1775. And we sort of... It takes like a year for them to actually get on board with this idea of independence, where in July 2nd they declare independence, and on the July 4th they sign the Declaration of Independence, and today we celebrate the 4th of July, which is kind of silly if you think about it, because we didn't win it until 1781 when George Washington single-handedly defeated the entire British army at Yorktown, or had help from the French and Spanish, probably the latter. The war officially ends in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris, uh, in which the USA was declared an independent country that Britain had to recognize, and now owned all land uh, east of the Mississippi River. Unfortunately, that's the reason we have Ohio. Ugh. So where does this leave the country now, this new United States of America? 60% of the country did not want to have independence, and a lot of the African Americans that were expecting to have freedom and equality after the war because they fought for the Continental Army didn't receive it. Neither did the women. Suffice to say, that's totally not what happened. And it's all loyalists who were loyal to the king received their property back after the war, despite being blatantly against the independence movement. But it's probably because they were white that they got their property back. Now let's take into consideration African slaves who fought in the Continental Army, who were wounded in the Continental Army, fighting for this patriotism. They had to be returned to their masters. Like, how messed up is that? And let's talk about the women. We had women like Deborah Sampson who pulled a Mulan-style charade so that she could fight in the war. And when she's done, she's still seen as inferior to men. Okay? Despite what Abigail Adams says in her letters to her husband, John Adams, remember the ladies and be more favorable, excuse me, be more favorable to them than your ancestors which is still unfortunately true today, considering, yes, women can vote and women can own property, but they still only make 78 cents to every man's dollar. Yikes. So how revolutionary was the American Revolution? We dumped the king in a most epic manner. But how much did the government change? Did minorities gain more rights? What is it going to be the situation with the Native Americans? We didn't even get to talk about them. As we continue to look at American history, remember, a revolution is something, when something changes, but when it comes full circle, isn't it where we began? Food for thought. Thanks for watching.